the story of Vito Genovese, the mafia guy, and his flight to Europe and how we got him back in the U.S. In 1937, Genovese fled to Italy, where he was born in Italy, but he was a U.S. citizen. Uh, he became a U.S. citizen. Anyway, he was he escaped a murder charge, and so while he's, he went to Italy to do that, while he's in Italy, he did what he saw as a practical thing, and he supported Bonita Mussolini. Uh, that worked out until 1943. Uh, by then it was obvious the Allies were going to take over all of Europe and Mussolini was done. And um, the so Genovese walked into the Allied military governor's office, this guy Colonel Charles Poletti, formerly of the New York lieutenant governor uh, under Thomas Dewey. And he walked in the office and he walked out an official uh, interpreter. Uh, on Pelotti's staff, assigned to this huge supply base in Nola, Italy. So again, Pelotti is the former New York lieutenant governor. I mean, he had to have known who Genovese was. Anyway, U.S. Major E.N. Holmgren, uh, the civil affairs officer at the Nola base, was so impressed with Vito Genovese that he wrote a letter of recommendation for him in 1943. It read, in part, the bearer of this letter, Vito Genovese, is an American citizen. When the undersigned arrived at the NOLA district base, blah, 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 Mr. Genovese met with me and acted as my interpreter for over a month. He would not accept, he would accept no pay. He paid his own expenses. Let me tell you something. At that time, the McClellan Committee figured he was worth $30 million. This is 1943. Um, Worked day and night and rendered most valuable assistance to the Allied military government. This statement is free, freely made in an effort to express my appreciation for the unselfish services of this man. Well, what happened was Genovese, when he got to this base, it was a huge base where supplies were brought in from Africa and all other parts of Europe and the United States and then spread out to Italy, which was starving. And we had a lot of troops there, and we had to feed them and so forth. So Genovese immediately begins this enormous black market on the base. His office is on the base. So he's stealing U.S. supplies, cigarettes, liquor, wheat, food, medicine, you name it, he took it, and then he resold it. So this guy, Sergeant Orange C. Dickey, D-I-C-K-E-Y, he's 24 years old, 1944. He was a former campus policeman in Pencil at the Pennsylvania State College, uh, and he was then in the Criminal Investigation Division in the war now. Dickey had been investigating the black market activities in the olive oil and wheat uh, business in Italy between Foggia, I'm not saying F-O-G-G-I-A, Foggia, and Naples. So a member of the local mafia who had married an American wanted to get in good with the American people and resented the fact that uh, Genovese had been in tight with Mussolini because Mussolini really put the mafia in, aside from Genovese, the Italian mafia uh, through the ringer. He really, he just dragged them out of their houses and threw them in jail or killed them, you know. So this mafia guy was, he had a, he had a hatchet to bury so he goes to the CDI, the, the criminal investigation people, including Dick, and he says, look, there's this guy, Vito Genovese, he's an American. He runs all the black market activities around here. He's talking about uh, Naples. Uh, and he's the head of the mafia in southern Italy. So he pointed... Uh, Dickey to this vineyard, vineyard, about seven miles away from the base at Nola. So Dickey goes there and he finds several United States trucks that had been destroyed. And that was how Genovese operated. He, his men hijacked the trucks, they stole the loot, right? They hijacked him from the base, they drove him to this vineyard or any place else he could find, transferred them, and then burned the trucks. Um, so Dickey traces the serial numbers on the trucks, and he finds out they're all stolen from the docks or from NOLA or in Naples. And they were, uh, when they arrived, they had been driven to the quartermaster supply. They were loaded principally with flour and sugar. And then they disappeared. Those were the trucks he found. So we're talking about hundreds of other trucks as well. So Dickey arrested two Canadian soldiers who had deserted their post of service drivers on those trucks. And they, they didn't want any trouble. They said, look, we don't know nothing about nothing. We drove the trucks. We, when we got to the destination, we were told to tell the locals, Italians, Genovese sent us. That's all they knew. So in 1944, Dickey has tracked Genovese down to this lavish apartment in Naples. He wasn't there. 
but he said he'd never seen such a how beautiful, how lavish it was. So at first, Dickie didn't know who Genovese was. And he came across a newspaper article and then a book uh, from the 1930s that bore Genovese's photographs and identified him as a leader of the underworld in the United States in New York, a very powerful guy. Then he came across the book, read the same thing. So Dickey contacted the FBI, and he says, look, we're going after this guy named Genovese. Do you know anything? Is there any outstanding warrants? And then later he got a reply, yeah, there's a warrant for him in Brooklyn, New York, for murder, and we'll send you a copy of it. But without that warrant, he could hold him when he arrested him, but there wasn't a lot else he could do without the warrant. He'd have to give him up after a certain time if the warrant didn't arrive. That sounds easy today, but, you know, there was a war going on. There's a, there was a lot happening in the world. So it, there's a possibility the warrant may not have. And don't forget, it's New, New York. I mean, Genovese has a lot of influence there. He could make the warrant not appear. But he didn't know it was being sought. Anyway, on August 27, 1944, Genovese, of all people, arrives at the town mayor of NOLA, and he requests a travel permit. He's got an armed chauffeur with him. So while the bodyguard is parked in the car, Genovese is about to step out. Uh, Dickey made his move. He said, I approached Vito Genovese in a company of two English soldiers and requested that he accompany me to the police office in NOLA, which he did. Immediately after the arrest of Vito Genovese, I proceeded to downtown Nola and confiscated the vehicle in which Genovese had been riding. The vehicle was an Italian car, a Fiat Model 1500. I searched the vehicle, and in the compartment of the rear front seat, I mean the private front seat, I guess the other front seat, I found two Italian weapons, one 9mm Beretta and the other a 7.6 Victoria, both fully loaded. So then Vicky went to Genovese's apartment again, and he searches the place. Um, and he finds huge qualities, quantities of supplies. There's so people that, things that in the United States people were doing without, you know, I mean, there was no sugar. So he finds everything, candy bars, cigarettes, boxes and boxes. There's a radio receiver, and he turns it on. And turns out uh, what the receiver was for was a he had uh, contacts outside of Italy who would tell them, look, they're shipping flour tomorrow and that sort of thing. So among the documents he finds in the apartment are business cards and other papers that link him, Genovese, to pretty powerful businessmen in the area, as well as judges, the mayor of the NOLA, the president of the Bank of Naples, and several officers, Amer American military officers. There were nine official travel passes made out to the bearer. In other words, he could sign any name he wanted. That made Genovese pretty powerful because you couldn't just zip around with the war had just ended. They were looking for war criminals. Uh, and it intended the bearer to fill up with American gasoline at American bases. Two of the papers were signed by, signed by officers that entitled Genovese to receive not only gasoline but American food. This is a direct violation of, of regulations. One business card belonged to Innocencia Innocence Monteserisi. She was a mistress for Genovese, but she was also a, she, a, 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 a madam. She provided uh, top dollar hookers to the Allied brass. So a few hours after the arrest, Genov Genovese is in jail at the military headquarters. Nicholas Cutulli, who was the chief Questator of Rome. He's a senior investigator for the police. He arrives in the entire country. He arrives at Dickey's office in Naples and he demands that Genovese be released. He doesn't give any reason. He just wants him released. So luckily this time his officers backed him up and they said, no, we're not going to release him. But So he's got this pressure from the Italian government. And he started, Dickey now, starting to get higher pressure from, from higher relief guys in the U.S. Army. They, they want him to release Genovese. So he reports his findings to the provisional U.S. officer at NOLA, and the officer tells him, drop the investigation. We have better things to do. Nicky, uh, Dickey then went to Rome, and he met a Colonel Poletti, who refused to discuss the case at all. In fact, Poletti pretended to be sleeping. Uh, to have fallen sound asleep when Dickey's trying to tell him, look, I've got this guy. So how many higher up to the military did Genovese bribe? It's a lot, I'm sure. These guys, you know, before the war, they were whatever. I mean, they, they had white-collar jobs, but now they're colonels and generals, and they're not rich. 
but he could make them rich. So a lot of these officers were reluctant to persecute, prosecute Genovese. They just wanted the whole thing. In fact, a lot of them attested in writing that he was, quote, invaluable. His contributions to the war effort, we didn't, we would have lost to Hitler without him, blah, blah, blah. So Dickey is just fed up. He goes to Rome and he meets with a former district attorney who had prosecuted the murdering cases. Brigadier General William O'Dwyer. Well, O'Dwyer, you, you know, he was so crooked they had to screw him in when he died. He was he became mayor of New York and then he fled to Mexico. He was pulled before a hundred. He was a crook, and he told Dickey, you know, there's nothing I can do for you. You're basically a pain in the ass, and why don't you just drop this case because nobody really wants to do anything to help it. Let it go. So. <laughs> Dickey goes back to the base. He found that there's orders uh, that beat him to the base. That Genovese uh, needed to get out of the military prison to either put him in under a bond that he promised to reappear, which we all know he wouldn't, or transfer him to a civilian jail. Well, he found some honest guys in the Italian government. They were disgusted with Genovese's dealings with uh, Mussolini, and they locked him in the most secure jail they had. And then Dickey went there twice a day to make sure he was still there. So Genovese, at one point, offers Dickey a quarter of a million dollars in cash, $250,000 in cash. Now, Dickey was making around $2,700 a year. So Genovese, and then when he got out, he wouldn't have made a lot more, probably. Genovese is offering him what would be today $4 bucks cash, tax-free, no questions asked. Dickey turned it down. So then Genovese said, well, look, let me put it to you this way. I'll kill you and your family. How about that? Now, let me go. And Dickey refused. He wouldn't be intimidated. It's an amazing story, isn't it? So the next month, Dickey took Genovese aboard. A, the, the warrant for his arrest came. Dickey took, uh, Dickey took that. And Genovese tossed him on a, on a troop ship, and they went back to New York. By the way, on the troop ship over, they had a lot of time on their hands. I don't know, a couple of weeks, I guess, they took to get there, or a week. So Genovese taught him how to how to uh, bribe people and gave him all the inside stuff on how to be a gangster. Uh, anyway, all the things that Dickey went through, it was for naught. The murder case against Genovese fell apart, uh, and Genovese walked out of jail. He was free to build the mafia again in America. I'm sorry I wasn't able to find out a lot about Mr. Dickey. Uh, I know he was born in 1920 in Cambria, Pennsylvania. He completed a year of college before he was drafted. He joined the Army. He wasn't drafted. And then when he got out of the war, he moved to Altoona, Pennsylvania. He's married. He had one son and one daughter, and he opened a bakery. In 1958, he'd appeared before Bobby Kennedy at the McClellan hearings on organized crime and told the story, and he died in 2005. I, I was not able to find a photo of the guy. I wish I could. Uh, if you have one, please let me know. I'd like to see... Uh, in fact, I'll post it if you have one. He, he deserves that, don't you think? 